is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our ongoing study of the letter of James. Uh, this today, I think, is our, our 11th part of this study. That's, and that's we'll right. be picking it up in James uh, chapter 4, verse 9. Oh, I thought we were further on. Bless you, my child. <laughs> James 4, 9. And we're going to do that right after I ask God's blessing on our time. And to put a guard over my mouth. Lord, that nothing would come out of my mouth that you've not put into my heart. Hallelujah. Lord, you've told us to test everything, and I pray, Lord God, that everybody that hears us will test it according to your word. For, Lord, it's not I don't desire for anybody to have a desire to hear what I have to say about something. But, Lord, that we would all have a burning desire to hear what you have to say about everything. So, Lord, just be with us, guide us. We praise you and thank you for being our God who leads us in paths of righteousness. Amen and amen. Amen. All right, as I said, we're, we're in the letter of James. We're in the fourth chapter, and we left off last week in the eighth verse. So we're going to pick up in 4 9, James 4 9. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Well, that just doesn't sound like a lot no, of fun, it does it? No. no. So who is James saying that to? Now remember, he's writing to the church. Yes. But he's writing to, and he's focused here on the proud, the sinners, the double-minded in the church. Right. Uh, you know, it says in Amos, I'm going to read Amos uh, chapter 5, starting in verse 18. This is God speaking to his people. He says, Alas, you who are looking for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light, as when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him, or goes home, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? Well, God will do whatever it takes, but you have to understand something. I hear a lot of people in the church who are, you know, even so come Lord Jesus, he's coming. We better make sure that we're prepared for that, okay? Uh, one of the ways you should know if you're prepared for it is, he's saying here, be miserable and mourn and weep to those people. But Jesus Christ said, blessed are those who mourn in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount, That's Matthew right. chapter 5. It depends on what your, where your heart is. We should be mourning for the lost. We should be mourning for those people in the world who are not prepared at all for his coming. And having that, having that hurt, that pain on their behalf, that should give us a motivation to be sharing the love and the word of God with them so that they wouldn't be lost. Okay, I'm going to move right on to verse 10. James says, humble yourselves in the presence. It says sight, by the way, in the King James. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. You know, it's, it's God's desire to exalt us, to lift us up. Lift us up because he has lifted us up out of the mire, out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and set our feet upon a rock. He has seated us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. God's desire is to lift us, but we need to have a willingness to be humble, to lower ourselves, that God, Christ, may be exalted and lifted up in our lives, okay? Humble yourselves. We, we talk about this a, a lot, but I promise you we don't talk about this enough. Right. Because pride is probably the single most dangerous thing in the church. Right. It's not Satan. Satan's been defeated. That's what it right. says. Right. He's been displayed as defeated. He's not our problem. When Jesus Christ said it is finished on that cross, Satan was a done for deal. Mm -hmm. Where the danger to us is pride, and it's a great, great danger. Think about this. This is a verse that I think is so important that I, even, I don't like to go to, but I mean it's so important. In the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that magnificent teaching, Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, talking about the day of judgment, the day we come face to face with him, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to him, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, that's verses 22 and 23. How in the world is there any greater pride possible than to come into the presence of the risen Christ with his outstretched, outstretched nail-scarred hands ready to welcome us and say to him, look at what I did. It's, it's just inconceivable. It really it is. It is. And yet, he says, many will do that. Yeah. Many will do that. Because it is it is the, the fallen human nature of man to want to lift ourselves. Right. And they are operating totally in the flesh. Remember, that's why it was so magnificent that John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. Right. It's that willingness to be nothing right. so that Christ can be everything that will keep you from that danger. Giving the Lord all the glory. And remember, I said, you know, in the King James, it, it, it says that uh, it says to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, right? Yes. And that's a more accurate translation, by the way. Uh, well, it says in Psalm 34, 15, that the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteousness and his ears are open to their cry. God is watching us. He has his eyes upon us. Yes. Right? You know, why, why would he have his eyes? Because we're precious in his sight. When you have something that's so precious to you, you make sure you keep an eye on it and watch out for its well-being, all right? Like it says in Second Chronicles, that's what he's searching, for hearts that are completely Completely his. his. He's searching for it. And when he comes back now, he will be searching for faith in our lives. That's right. Which is... is which is in the heart. Because faith resides in the heart. Right. For, for the heart man believes, all right? Now... We're told in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 5 through 8, that we are to have this attitude or this mind in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself. Amen. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King of glory, he humbled himself before the Father. We, we really need to take this to heart, and we need to be considering our activities, our, everything that we're doing. Our, is our life about glorifying him or about us seeking him to glorify us? Yes. Like I said, the Lord's desire is to lift us up. So Paul would go on to say in Philippians, I'm going to read Philippians 3.14. He said, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to know that the call of God in our lives is an upward call. Yes. He is not desiring to put us down in the neck or he is desiring to lift us up. He wants to raise you higher and higher and higher. But that requires us mm -hmm. to desire to raise him higher and higher and higher. And because finish. what he will do is it continues there. In, in Philippians chapter 3, he said, and talking about Jesus, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He's going to lift us up. He's going to glorify us. What do we have? What's our hope? Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's, that's what, That should be our hope. Do everything, everything in your power to point people towards Jesus. Because Jesus always points people to the Father. Don't get impressed by all of these sermons that you may hear, teachings you may hear about how God wants to make you more and more. He'll make you more and more. I promise you he'll make you more than you are. Right. If you're willing to be less than you are. What do you think? All right? I think... When we're having conversations with people, we should make sure that they always end up back with Jesus. What else is it? Yeah. Who else is it? What else matters? Well, no, it doesn't. That's why our ministry on, on the earth here 
I'm, I'm, I'm actually planning on doing a teaching on this later this week. What is the ministry of the church? Want to take a guess? Don't do it. <laughs> I mean, the ministry of the church is very simple on earth, all right? To equip the saints for the work of service. No. To make the love of God mm -hmm. visible, mm -hmm. right? And and to make it, um, let's say the word I used, it begins with me. Well, to make the love of God, our job is to make the love of God visible. All right. And we do that by by denying ourselves because it's, it is fallen human nature to want to be loved. I mean, and have people uh, lift us up and care more about us and see how what great, great people well, we are. Because the world is lifting up self. I mean, that's that's all they're interested in is themselves. Well, so it's the complete opposite of what we should be doing. Not only is that true, but it becomes truer by the day. Yes. Because that was the first thing that Paul talked about when he wrote to Timothy in the second letter to Timothy and said in the perilous last days, in the last day, perilous times to come. And the first thing he talks about is being lovers of self. Yes. That's the great, great danger. Uh, great, great danger. When you know that you have an overwhelming love that comes from him, it's not that just that he loves us. No. He is love. That's right. God is love. And he has shown it over and over and over. You know, I, I think one of the most beautiful things in Scripture, and we can get this in our head, is what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. And I believe Paul literally turned the Roman, he turned the world upside down. Yes, he did. Right? A, a, a Jewish tent maker. How did he turn the world upside down? Because he said in Romans 8, that he has this fixation on the fact of how much God loved him. God the Father. Because if God the Father would put his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross in his place, what good thing would he withhold from us? But it comes from having that attitude that we see the love of God the Father in Jesus Christ. And it's, I was going to say it's sufficient. And it is sufficient. The unfortunate part is that English word can't begin to express just what a great, great gift it is. And that's in Romans 8, 38. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. That is That's so amazing. Nothing. Yeah. There's no power in nothing. hell. There's no power on earth. There is no power that has the ability to take you away from Christ. Nothing. There's only one person in the yourself. entire world that can do that, and that's you, yourself. That's this is my greatest enemy. You know, Jesus said, listen, you can't be my disciple unless you deny yourself, unless you die to yourself. I, I don't know how much that's taught in the church today. Mm. Uh, you know, they're about self-denial. It's like, you know, what, what are we going to get? What are we going to get? Well, we have to come to that place where our focus is on denying ourselves. Not like some, you know, Greek uh, philosopher who just wants to. No, the, the purpose is to exalt Jesus Christ. He will not share his, God will not share his glory with another. That's what it says. So if he's not going to share his glory. And we have to see that all the glory goes to him. Because otherwise, any glory we get, any recognition we get, is taking it away from him. Amen. And remember, his name is Jealous. He is a yes. jealous God. Yes. So, all right, let me move right along to verse 11. James 4 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. The key word there is against, all right? Mm -hmm. it, it says, you know, speak against. And in the King James, it says, uh, don't speak evil. However, that same Greek word is translated as speak against when, he, when, he uses, when Peter uses it in 1 Peter 2.12. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that doesn't mean that our, our brothers and sisters, we don't see sin in their lives. Right. Because he also, because didn't he say that we are not to judge outsiders, right. but 
we are to judge those brothers yeah, and sisters. Well, we might even talk about that in, in, in Corinthians chapter 5. Right? So, and it says, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 18, he said, if you see your brother sin, if, you see, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Matthew 18, 15. Well, if you see your brother sin, are you judging him to, re to recognize that? Yeah. No, you're not. You're not judging him. No, you're not judging him. Well, you're seeing him. Oh, you're seeing him sin. So it's if, not if you see a yes, brother sin, right. you're not judging to say, you know, that's that's not good. Right. But you have to have the right behavior from that point on. You have to not go condemn him. Right. What you need to do is go and, and not and not in judgment, but what you need to do is go there with a heart that has a desire. To see that brother restored. Because sin separates you from God. Right. It says that clearly in Isaiah. Sin separates you from God. I don't want to see any of my brothers and sisters separated from God. I certainly don't want to see me separated from God. So that's why I said, you know, it's in these perilous last days, in perilous last days they are indeed, one of the most important things you can have is good fellowship. And you know what I say good fellowship is? Good fellowship is being around people who love you enough. That if they see you doing wrong, they will come to you in love and speak it to you, tell you. Because you can't, listen, don't trust yourself. Okay. Because no, our heart is more deceitful than anything above, else. Above all else. Yes, absolutely. So if, if you see your brother sin, go to him and you're going to talk to him. You, how, what are you going to talk to him about? His sin? Well, what you want to do is bring him the word of God. Because Paul wrote to Timothy and said, all scripture, the word of God, is inspired by God mm -hmm. and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16. So if you see me doing something wrong, saying something wrong, it, I see it as a blessing. It may not feel good to my flesh, but I tell you what, it's life. And it's life to my spirit. Come and say something to me. But do it the way scripture says, come. No, no. Oh, yeah, look at you. Look what you're doing. No, it's a matter of desiring to restore them. If you're, this is one of the problems we have in our society, in our world today, is that there's not much correction. There's not much discipline. I mean, when I look out in the world, I see a lot of undisciplined children. Why are they undisciplined children? Because they don't honor their parents, their father and their mother. But why aren't they disciplined? Because they haven't been trained up. I don't know why. Oh, why, why are why aren't the parents disciplined? Oh, why aren't the parents? Yeah. Disciplined? I don't know why. <laughs> well, because discipline is a blessing. Yeah, it is. It's not a curse. It's a blessing because it corrects what's wrong. I mean, you know, if if you were wanted to be a really really good golfer, you might go out and, and get instruction lessons from a, a golf teacher, mm -hmm. right? Instructor. Instructor. There you go. So would you be upset if the golf instructor said to you, you know what, you need to you need to do this differently than you're doing it? No. That's what you want him to do. That's what you need him to do. So you'll become better and better at it. Why do we not see that when it comes to the word? You know, we need people in our lives who love us enough that if they see us swinging wrong, doing something wrong, they will come to us in love and say, you know what? You need to change that. And not come with angry or... It's, it's got to be gentle. It has to be no condemnation. Exactly. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right. All right? So so let's let's have that kind of love in our lives. And the other thing to look at is if, if you're seeing your brother sin, if they're sinning, they're, they're doing something against God. Absolutely. And that should be the main motivator to, to go to them and say, look, you're not walking right with the Lord right now. This What you're doing is, is not honoring God. Does God not say in Hebrews that he disciplines those whom he loves? Yes, he does. If you love people, you should... You should dis What's the difference between the word discipline and disciple? Disciple. Mm -hmm. disciple. Training. It's, it's training. training. That's what it is. That's all it is, is training. So, but by the same token now, it says, if you see your brother sin, that's what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. But how do you know anybody's sin? Unless their action is judged against the Word of God. Right. Test, tested. 
You know, I have said, how many times do I say this? And I, I, if I haven't said it enough times, I'll say it again. Don't trust me. Test, Test me. Amen. Test all things. Examine all things and hold fast that which is good. Did Paul condemn the Bereans because they dared to question what he no. taught? No, he praised them for yes, it. Yes, he did. Because when they, Paul would teach them, they would get out the old scriptures, they'd get out the scrolls, unroll make the sure scrolls, was... and make sure that he was telling them what was so. That's right. So we, we that should be our desire, but not to find fault. No, not to go in to look for things wrong. No, because it becomes a protection for you, yeah. and it becomes a protection for the person you're listening to, right? Okay. You know, too many people go into the scriptures trying to just prove their point. Uh, yeah. And not looking for... Where pride. does that come from? Pride. Damnable pride. Yeah. As Arthur Burt used to say. That's true. That's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 12, 40, verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Doesn't it say, it does say, I'm not going to ask you, in Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrows and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Where is that? And for, he was 412. We're all going to be judged. And you know, judgment starts in the household of God. I want to tell you something. I've been judged. Mm -hmm. That's... I've been judged. Found guilty. Yes. I mean, if you want to understand what amazing grace is, you better understand that there's none righteous, no, not even one. And I've been, you know, like you, I have been judged and found wanting. Yes. However, by the amazing grace of God, Jesus took the punishment for my failure. That's, that should be a, a, a constant blessing in your life, understanding that and knowing that. We so deserve it. We so deserve it. And let's get something straight about this whole thing about judging, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to read to you from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 9. Because this is really, really important. Paul said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Good teaching. Mm -hmm. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with the covetous and swindlers, or with the idolaters. For then you have to go out of the world. They're all that way. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. If he is an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. So it says, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. Is that judging? This would seem to be yes. a command of God through Paul. Make sure that you are judging your brothers. So it's and not contradicting. No, but it's not looking for fault. No, no, it isn't. You know, when you have the mind of Christ. That's what it is. What judging is, that's, that's what you're out there looking for. What sin are they doing? Oh, let's see what sin they're doing. But if you have the mind of Christ and the heart of God, and that love of God poured into your heart, I'm going to tell you something. When you see something wrong, it's going to be like... Nails on a blackboard, right, you know, right. it's going to it's going to be whoa, whoa, it's going to get your attention yeah. And if it gets your attention, it is not for judgment or condemnation against that person But it's a warning sign. I mean what parent would not warn his child No matter how strong it had to be that they saw them doing something that was dangerous to them Life-threatening. Well, and any sin is life-threatening to us. It's like if you have a if you have a toddler and you happen to look out on your front yard and you see them crawling out into the street, would you say, oh, baby, don't, that, don't that, do that. That, that's probably not a good idea to do that. You'd be screaming and hollering. Yeah, you'd say, I'm going to count to three, come back. I'm going <laughs> to... But the point is, you don't do that to harm them. You do that to save them from harm. Right. 
Remember, you remember that Jesus said in the, God, in the Sermon on the Mount, for in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Matthew 7, 2. Well, that shouldn't scare you. No. I mean, if you're judging according to the Word of God, recognize that you're going to be judged according to the right. Word of God. And that should not upset you, scare you, or cause you concern. You're going to live by the Word. You're going to judge by the Word. Amen. And you are going to be judged by the Word. Mm -hmm. So you're safe judging by the Word. Amen. Not your interpretation of it. No. That takes us back to that verse we were talking about in, in 2 Timothy 3.16, right? We're, we're doing this out of love. Whatever we do, we're motivated by love. And by the way, you're not being the lawgiver. You're not setting the law. This, this is one of the problems in so many, so much of the church. It's like the church is making the rules. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed. Are you saying sign now? Twenty eight. Alice is telling me we run out of time. <laughs> how can that be? How can that be? <laughs> how can that how can that be? I was trying to be subtle. <laughs> I used to say to the Lord all the time, don't be subtle with me. <laughs> if I'm doing something wrong, bonk me on the head. <laughs> Get my attention. All right, well, Father, we appreciate the time that we do have. Thank you, Lord. And we're looking forward to that place in, in our lives when we come into your truly come into your the fullness of your presence yes. when time will be no more. Hallelujah. And we will just be with you for all eternity. When we can say as you do, Thank you, Lord. what's the difference between a day, a year, and a month? For a year is as a thousand days as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Because we're looking for, one of the things that I'm so looking forward to, especially as we've been going through this COVID-19, you know, and it's, it's in places around the world, it's getting worse and worse, mm -hmm. where we have not had the opportunity to share with people, get with people physically the way we would normally do. Right. I got to tell you, I'm looking forward to being with my brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in a big, great big, and this is a religious term, hug fest. <laughs> where we wrap each other up in our arms and just love each other up. Amen. And Father, I thank you that we'll do that with the love that you have poured into thank our hearts, Lord. Lord God. Lord, that what a joy it will be when we all are together. Amen. Lord, I, I pray that by our lives, you will use them to draw more people to you so that there will be more of us there that day to hug one another. We thank you for your word because it is your word that molds us and shapes us. It is your word, Lord God, that does such amazing, wonderful things in our life. Help us to have a greater love to hear what you say, a desire to hear what you have to say to us. And Lord, having heard, to obey. So we praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Are you sure you're having a time right now? Oh my goodness gracious. Zooming by. <laughs> well, since you have a minute, why don't you sit down and write us an email at office at BibleTalk.com and let us know where you're listening to from or watching from. Yeah. And tell, you just, you know, let us know. Just say, hey, I'm, I'm Johnny or I'm Ralph or I'm... So we'll Send be looking us a for you. <laughs> so we'll be looking for you on that day. Hallelujah. Amen. Until next week. Yes. God bless you and goodbye. Bye. Bye. to the